Thank you, Doctor. Um, good morning. My name is Pascal, and I will be. In, well, I have the pleasure of introducing our first session today um, with our work at Tohoku University, Japan, uh, alongside Professors Takashima Fujita and Kitamura, regarding pursuit sensing, which is a concept that we've developed in order to propose extended hand tracking for um, extended hand tracking space. Sorry for mobile VR applications. So, as the title implies, we focus here on the, the combination of two technologies, which are VR and hand tracking, because uh, we believe that by enabling natural interactions for VR, we can propose uh, increased embodiment as well as um, immersion and user presence compared to what can be achieved normally with uh, classical controllers. And this allows us as well to uh, offer more design possibilities as well as content possibilities for both users and developers. And another keyword that's quite important in our work is mobile VR. So we believe that this is especially relevant when room scale uh, VR applications were enabled uh, pretty much as soon as people started doing VR at home, but more recently as well through industry um, well, when the industry has been pushing forward uh, arena scale VR experiences in, in VR arcades or recently the case of, of Ubisoft proposing VR escape rooms and the, um, well, the appearance of mass consumer products such as the, the Oculus Quest as well which negates completely the use of uh, any, any computer or, or cabling. And to enable hand tracking for, for any kind of applications really, uh, there are essentially two uh, main classes of, of solutions here. So the first approach is what we call the equipment based. So you basically have to wear hardware or, or basically hardware or equipment on your hands directly to be able to track them. And this includes technologies such as the gloves and an optical sensor uh, markers and such. And the second approach here is um, well, users make use of computer vision through. Um, camera sensors essentially, so whether that would be depth or RGB technologies. And we focus here on the later option because we argue that the first one is uh, fight to be quite cumbersome and uh, it has been proven that there are issues such as the, um, basically tactile sensing inhibition and such. And by using camera sensors we can also make use of the more recent advances in terms of computer vision and finger tracking algorithms that are getting more and more robust by the years. But for essentially hand tracking with camera sensors for VR, the current approach is, is to stick the camera sensor onto the HMD or use the, the sensors that are directly embedded onto the HMD and this poses a lot of uh, issues. So just to see aside a few, um, we can say that there are fatigue and strain concerns because you have to raise your hands at head level to be able to track them. And there's also what we call gaze dependency, which is to say you, when you look around in VR and move your head around, you essentially have to keep uh, your hands in front of your head and move alongside your gaze to be able to track them. And another set of limitations that are more inherent to camera solutions is the fact that their range is limited. So this concerns the, well, this is uh, to say the, that multiple cameras made by multiple manufacturers and different solutions have all different um, ranges of specifications and FOV sizes. And the overall volume itself is pretty limited and cramped. And the, the issue is that when we do mobile VR where the users can walk around and the tracking range and tracking space has to follow the user around, this is pretty difficult to, to solve um, in itself. So before moving on to our approach, I'd like to introduce a few related works. So we, well, in order to find the solutions, we basically surveyed a lot of um, hand tracking interfaces that are body worn. So that are directly users cameras, of course, but are worn on the user's body. So we can cite the finger mouse, which is a piece of hardware that uses RGB cameras and, and basically webcams. Um, that can be placed uh, anywhere essentially on the, on the user's body to enable very simple hand um, or gesture inputs to, to be able to emulate a, a finger mouse, uh, a, finger, a computer mouse, sorry. And there's also the Limu device on your right, which is a hand tracking sensor that is mounted on the user's wrist, so there's no risk of, of tracking loss because the camera faces directly the hand. 
and uh, the position of the arm itself is tracked by a, an inertial measurement unit on the mount. Another set of related works that's pertinent for our work is sensor motorization. So there's a couple of important works here. The first one is what we call proactive sensing. And it's essentially a technique to enable a single degree of freedom control for a hand tracking sensor to be able to reorient itself. But this is, uh, well, this focuses on pose estimation quality. So it's in order to increase accuracy for the hand pose. And this is a data-driven approach as well in, in the way that it needs um, well, it needs training beforehand, and it focuses on static, static poses, uh, which is quite limited, but the reorientation itself uh, and its idea can be repurposed for our problem here. And the, the second work here is, uh, deals with, well, just um, hybrid robotic cameras that are mounted on robots to perform event recording, so it follows multiple targets here, just basketball players, and the, the footage that is used in production is actually limited to a virtual frame, so it's a bit small, but um, on, the, on the left here you can see a virtual frame that is within the actual um, FOV of the camera. And they only use that part so that the extra space within the FOV can be used for reorientation and compensate for the camera's movements. And uh, this idea, this buffer idea, can be actually extended to, to solve our problem as well. So here I'd like to introduce pursuit sensing, which is the well, essentially the, the concept that we came up with. And here's what the system looks like. So we take a hand tracking device and mount it on a, an action camera gimbal that was essentially um, initially meant for, for drones and event recording. And uh, the, the, the gimbal itself is mounted on a torso mount that we place on, on the user's body to be able to stabilize it around the user's chest. And here's the device in actual use. So we basically enable real-time uh, controlling of the gimbal as well as all the, the calculations to convert the, the coordinates of the hand from the gimbal's referential to absolute world coordinates in, in the virtual environment. And um, the, when the gimbal reorients itself, uh, we actually uh, allow for uh, tracking loss when, well, with the, the tracking loss when it occurs, we allow for the gimbal to return to a base, solution, well, a base position that you can see here. And this is done at 60 frames per second. In order to achieve this, we'd like to introduce two concepts uh, within Pursuit Sensing's core ideas. So the first idea is to motorize the tracking sensor through PID control. And we say that the, the target of the, the camera is, well, we constrain the target of the camera to the center of the FOV. So it's in, our, in our case, it's the, the center of the user's palm. And we make the camera pursue the target at real time so that it always remains in the, the middle of the FOV. So we enable this for both single hand and dual hand tracking, in which case we target the, the middle point of the segment between the two palms of the users. And well, by doing this, essentially all the remaining space around the user's hand becomes a, an FOV buffer that we can use in order to uh, compensate for the camera's reorientation. So the issue with that is that by reorienting the, the camera, we introduce lag and potential delay because the camera has to move around. And uh, well, the implementation forces us to constrain, constrain the gimbal speed to a constant within the control loop. So this is especially vulnerable against hasty motions that are quite common for, for VR. And well, in order to solve this, we thought about uh, the idea of focus shifting, which is to temporarily shift away the, the camera's target away from the hand in the direction of its velocity in order to enable temporary increases of speed within the control loop. So the, the implementation, the implementation sorry, itself, uh, we use a, a leap motion hand tracking sensor for its widespread commercial availability and a gimbal controller that's equally uh, easy to find online through various sellers. And we use a GoPro torso mount uh, that's customized to be able to stabilize the camera. The algorithm pipeline looks like the diagram on your right. It's pretty difficult to read, but the, most of the the implementation and the details can be found in the paper, and the entire implementation of the code is found online, is um, published online as well, so you can look into that. 
So I'm going to skip over that quickly, but um, just we essentially use uh, the Game Boy's pitch and your degrees of freedom of 2, and we run that through a control loop, and we use the leap motions, frame rate, uh, because we need to retrieve each of the hand positions of the leap motion at its own frame rate. And we then pull the gimbal's um, or torso orientation to be able to calculate the, the user's uh, torso orientation for the, the base frame of uh, the, the coordinate system of the, of the device. And for the absolute space in, in, in the absolute user space, uh, within the, the interaction area, we use the HMD's position. So moving on to evaluation, we perform two technical evaluations here. The first one is to assess the actual uh, tracking space of the device that can be achieved. So for that, as I said, the, the, in case of tracking loss, basically the gimbal reverts to the default position. So we know uh, when the gimbal would, uh, would, lose hand, would lose tracking of the hand. And on the right, you can see the theoretical range with uh, two parts, so the orange is the actual space when the, the gimbal moves, so it's actually reoriented. And the blue uh, area at both its limits is the sensor's FOV contribution at the limits of the orange space. So for this test, we manually um, well, moved around this space in, in around both extremities to determine whether um, the, the whole the theoretical tracking space is achieved or not. Second evaluation is uh, based on assessing the, the pursuit speed and robustness issues. So to do that, we need a well, a, an actually reliable uh, ground truth. So we basically took a fake hand that was recognized by the, the tracking sensor without issue, and we mounted that on a tracking robot. Um, sorry, an industrial robot, and we made it perform back and forth motions such as this uh, at various hand speeds, and we could um, essentially just uh, uh, note the speed down and, and compare it to compare the gimbal delay in, in itself compared to uh, the various hand speed that for, at which we moved the, the robot. So moving on to results, for the first um, evaluation we have a 142% increase in along the pitch uh, which is to say the, the vertical axis and 44% sorry, percent along the yaw axis. So this basically enables head to lap uh, interactions and tracking for, for mobile VR. And for the second part we so for the second part we perform two tests. The first one is to um, note the, the gimbal's reorientation delay against the hand speed of the, the robot. And so the, you can see there's a curve, basically this is the, the behavior of the, the internal behavior of the, the gimbal itself. And there's essentially, uh, it's max handling speed without any kind of uh, focus shifting or any kind of uh, technique enabled is at a thousand millimeters per second. And if we enable focus shift, the results can be seen on the diagrams below. Basically, the diagram on the left is with focus shift disabled and the right is enabled. So we can basically assert that it allows us to reduce the delay, although there's increased jittering uh, um, in the, um, the moment where the hand changes velocity. So a couple of words uh, regarding this approach. So person sensing versus multiple camera setups uh, is an important factor to consider. So the main idea is that this, the gimbal itself costs less than a, a single motion track, uh, leap motion sensor, so it's actually pretty interesting in terms of cost and simplicity. Uh, the idea itself is more flexible than having to uh, put in more camera setups uh, uh, to, to determine, the, well, to, you know, depending on the, the tracking range that is uh, wanted. And it is actually applicable to other types of sensing, not only, uh, well, cameras and uh, computer vision based sensors. The current limitations are hardware related on the gimbal's end. So we have uh, many factors that are weight, power, heat, cables, noise, etc. that can impact uh, potential, that have a potential impact on VR immersion and this needs to be uh, investigated further. And well, the system itself right now it depends on the, the camera that we use and the the solution of finger tracking algorithm that we use 
and it depends heavily on its robustness. And the gimbal itself, well, through PID control, it requires extensive P, um, PID parameter tuning. Uh, just as a conclusion quickly, um, the takeover message is that we can uh, provide significant FOV extension, and this enables, in turn, more freedom of interactions for VR, and the technique itself can be considered quite simple and cost efficient. So you might have noticed the lack of uh, user studies. This is definitely a concern that we uh, look into addressing in the future. And we look into gathering uh, user feedback through content that we've developed in order to um, assert the, the device's actual potential. And these contents will be featured at Seagraph Asia next month. And we look into improving the system itself as well by using knowledge from different in various fields, such as vision theory and how the human eye would move um, stuff like that. And the, the orientation speed itself and robustness um, can be, we believe that it can be enhanced further with these kind of considerations. And another idea is to use other camera sensors compared to the leap motion because, as I said, we can make use of various uh, hand tracking algorithms that were developed in the recent years. And that will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take. Questions? Time for a couple. Um, so you're asking a, a lot for a user to wear something uh, beyond. In, in today's day and age, we are kind of going to be less encumbered. So have you thought of other ways to enhance the value of wearing something on your chest beyond? So to provide um, more reasons to, to basically force users to work. Um, honestly, like the, we believe that the, um, the actual advantages and what can be gained um, by wearing the system itself on, on the torso is, um, uh, well, relevant enough compared to um, the, the actual yeah, necessity of asking users to wear the system in itself compared, for example, with um, all the types of system that you have to wear on your uh, or the, on, on the limbs, for example, and uh, the torso itself. Um, well, it is quite cumbersome to to basically just uh, mount the system at the the beginning of the of use. But um, you you quite well. We believe that you can you can forget it basically uh, that you wear the system one is you you engage yourself into VR and uh, it's it's less of a of a. Mental issue. Uh, I mean, mental uh, the mental workload and, and um, well, you, you can essentially uh, forget about the, the the fact that you're wearing the system compared to what would you what you would um, feel when wearing other other types of hardware. Thank you. Any projectors and theater lights and things in the past they take the dots of technique of keeping the apparatus fixed while right. generating the apparatus. Yes. And with the mirror. Do you know whether the lead motion device could work through a mirror? Because then you could fold the optical path and you have the lead motion device say pointing downward and have your pan tilt you can just have a mirror on it. So that's actually a very interesting approach. Um, the lead motion itself I do not believe that it would uh, work as the, the sensor itself is really sensible. So as long as there are infrared interference around the, the camera's FOV, it detects and weakens the sensor a lot. Um, but it, I think this approach can be applied to other camera sensors as well. And uh, it would be interesting to, to see how, um, what, what kind of uh, results we could achieve by instead rotating a mirror instead of the camera itself. Yes. Thank you, speaker, again. Thank you.